Okay, uh, can we put our hands together and welcome everybody that's joining online. Good to see you guys and girls all around the world uh, on our streaming services, Facebook, all of that. Grab this here. This is our sermon outline. Uh, this is what we're doing, everyone. Uh, back at the end of uh, 2021, uh, we were in the book of 1 Corinthians. We took a little break for Christmas. Then we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. But we're going to, across the next five weeks, we're going to finish the book of 1 Corinthians, okay? So uh, let me explain a little bit about this, okay? I want you to get in my time machine, okay? I want you to get in the DeLorean, everyone. Everyone remember the DeLorean? Interesting fact here, every single DeLorean ever made was made in Belfast, Northern Ireland. This car was made in Belfast, Northern Ireland, people, okay? Oh no, don't clap. We only built two things, the Titanic and the DeLorean, and they both sank. They both sank. That's what happened to them. But I got to get you in the time machine and bring you back almost 2,000 years ago to a city called Corinth, the second most important city in the Greek world at that time. Uh, a little bit like California, it was on the coast, it was nice and sunny, but uh, there was a lot of sexual immorality, okay? It was the capital of HBO. It was that type of place, okay? Always freaking out and crazy. Uh, and, but it was a church that Paul the Apostle planted himself on a second missionary journey. And it was a little bit unusual he stayed there for 18 months. That wasn't his style, but he felt directed by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit said to him, and this is important, everyone. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Pour your spirit out. The Holy Spirit is not a presence. He's not just a power. He is a person. And he speaks to us. And he was speaking to Paul in a vision. And he said to him, you need to stay here uh, because I've got a great many people in this city. So he stayed for 18 months and a great church was established. Fast forward four to five years, Paul gets the email. Yeah, have you ever had one of those texts that come and ding and you're like, no. Well, he gets a letter and it was from someone in the church. And they said, Paul, remember the dream church you planted? Well, it's not a disaster. It's full of division and schisms. Does that sound like America today? The whole thing is divided. And then Paul needed to write a letter addressing all of the issues. Now, you've got to think about this, okay? Don't think about like a massive American city like Los Angeles. This was probably a city of about 50,000 people. And you've got to think not about American mega church. It's probably 100 people that were believers at that time, not in a building like this with big screens, but in homes. That's where they would have met. Church would have met in multiple homes. So when the letter came from Paul, it would have been shared around the congregation, read in each of these homes. Now, we love this letter. It gives us an insight to so many things. But one thing it teaches us and gives us insight to is actually worship in the early church. We know through the book of Acts that they worship, but we didn't know how they worshiped. What did they do? Did they have a band? Did they have a Hammond organ? What did they actually have? Here's what we can understand. 1 Corinthians 11, we get an insight to how they had the Lord's Supper, communion, how they did communion, how that should operate. And also, and how spiritual gifts operated. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. The next five weeks, we're going to talk about great truths. But today, we're going to be talking about how you discover and how you develop your spiritual gifts. Now, I want to highlight this here, a little bit of theological insight. And you might want to write this down somewhere. Paul uses this tactic twice in the book of 1 Corinthians. There's misuse, disuse, proper use, okay? And what he does, he highlights the misuse but he doesn't advocate for disuse, just stop it. But he, what he does, he goes on to teach for proper use. He does this also with sex in chapter 5, 6, and 7. I mean, these Corinthians were crazy. They're having sex with everyone at any time. And Paul doesn't say disuse, just stop it. He doesn't go, he said gift, sorry, sex is God's gift from him. He wants you to use it with proper use. And spiritual gifts, he does the same formula. So wasn't Paul wasn't mad about spiritual gifts. He wasn't going crazy and didn't like them. Paul said, they are gifts from the Spirit. You just got to learn how to use them. So today, we're going to be looking at that. So in your outline, write this in straight away on how to discover and develop your spiritual gifts. The first thing that's so important is the importance of spiritual gifts. 
okay? They are just really important. What does Paul say to the church? He says this, now about the gifts of the Spirit, now I want you to notice this, they're not natural talents. They're not just a bias or a leaning inside of you. They are gifts of the Spirit. Gifts are charis, which is grace. You didn't earn them. You don't deserve them. God gave them to you. But they're also gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself chose you and equipped you. And he said, I want you to have a gift. Okay, so the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. And this says this, I do not want you to be uninformed. I want you to have the right information about it. This is why we're teaching this book. God wants you to be informed about the gifts that are inside of you, given to you by the Holy Spirit. You know that when you were pagans, look at me, everyone. Before we were Christians, I don't care if you went to Sunday school. I don't care if you were the nicest neighbor in the world. You were a pagan. Look at me, you were a pagan. yes. We didn't just know how to sin. We had a PhD in sin and we were brilliant sinners, everybody. That's what we were. But they were like expert pagans, i.e. they were going to temples. In the day, in the city of Corinth, there was lots of temples for different gods, multiple gods. They had sex gods as well and sex prostitutes. This was a crazy place. Somehow or other, it says you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Just look at this. He said to mute idols. Idols. You used to go up to temples. You actually had to go to a special religious place to find your God. And inside that temple, there would have been an idol and you would have done your incantations. You would have brought your sacrifices. You'd have done everything. And at the end of it, your God wouldn't have said a thing to you. You wouldn't have got a thing out of your, you would have been hitting the mute button on mute, on mute, the volume, the volume, and your little God just would have sat there and never said a thing. You were doing all the action. You were doing all the shouting. You were doing all the praying. You were doing all the worshiping and your God said nothing. And what does Paul say here? You have now come into a living relationship with the Spirit of God. You no longer go to a temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He now lives in you. He's equipped you. He's put gifts inside of you. And when you come to the local church, God is alive. And how do we know he's alive? Because people are using their spiritual gifts and God is speaking through us. Oh, you should be more excited than that, everyone. You're like, oh, well, that's like a slight upgrade from paganism. It's amazing, everybody. The church of Jesus Christ is alive. This is not our temple. This is just a building. And thank God it's got air conditioning and some lights. That's all it is, everyone. We are the temple and God is with us. I want you to get this as well. This is really, really important for us to understand that God has kept you on this earth because the Holy Spirit is inside of you and he's gifted you to serve the church. It's very important that we get this. So I want you to imagine this, maybe it was previously at a 945 service, I don't know, weeks ago or years ago, that uh, maybe at the end of the service, you prayed the prayer, you raised the hand, you walked over to the table, you met a Bayside person, you give your life to Jesus. I want you to notice this. You weren't raptured on the spot and went straight to heaven. You actually had to leave the building, get in your car. You were a brand new person, but God kept you on earth. Why? Because his spirit was now inside of you. He had given you gifts and God kept you on earth, not just to run your business, not just to try and raise a perfect family. God kept you on this earth that you might have spiritual gifts inside of you and serve the world around you. I want to introduce you to the rest of your life, everybody. You have a pulse, you have a breath, and you have gifts inside of you for one purpose, that every day we would serve the body of Christ. Amen? That's why we're here on earth. So the importance of gift is so, so important. And then there's the source of spiritual gifts. Look at this here, the source of spiritual gifts. What Paul does here is very important. He actually points to the Trinity. Uh, Thomas Schreiner in his great commentary, he says this, one of the striking features of verses four to six is their Trinitarian cast such that we see reference to the Spirit, to the Lord Jesus, and to God the Father. As Christians, okay, high schoolers, it's important that you know this, we believe there's one God, but in three persons. It's the mystery of the Trinity. One God, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and 
God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, not God the Holy Bible. Some of us have watered this down and we get nervous. We get nervous about the Holy Spirit. I don't know what your background is when you hear the Holy Spirit. Oh, some of that stuff's weird. Just, just get this for one second. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. The Holy Spirit makes me me. Did you get that, everyone? The Holy Spirit's making you weird. No, it's not the Holy Spirit. You're just weird, okay? <laughs> Stop blaming that one on God. You're just weird, okay? You're on the weirdometer right over here, okay? So let's keep God out of it. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. The Holy Spirit makes me me. But the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of God, the one God and three persons that's involved in the gifts. Look at this here, okay? There's a variety of gifts. There are different types of gifts, verse four, but the same Spirit distributes them. Verse five, variety of ministries. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And look at this, variety of effects. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work, God the Father. This is amazing. What is Paul doing here? Paul is pointing to the triune God who's in perfect uh, harmony. God is one God in three persons and it's like the best small group in the world. They've never had a fight. They've never had an argument. They all think the same. They just get on. God in three persons. And what Paul is saying here, you're a church that's divided. This was such a divided church. And it was ego had got in and people were dominating the church and there were schisms and they were saying, I like him better than I like him. I want to follow him. I want to follow Paul. No, I want to follow Apollos. And what Paul is doing here is saying, do you know what? God is working through you. God is in perfect unity. And if God is with you, you should be in unity together. Are you with me, everyone? So it's a simple thing that he does. But I want to jump here to number three. Are you glad that we're getting through this today? Some of you, you organized people, okay? Enneagram ones, you are just like, hey, we are doing this today. This is good. Okay, here we go. The purpose of spiritual gifts. The purpose of spiritual gifts. What we're going to read here in a second is nine gifts that Paul highlights. But Andrew Wilson in his commentary in 1 Corinthians, he says this. We don't believe that this is an exhaustive list of the nine gifts. There's nine and no more. We actually believe there's more. Paul refers to a couple more at the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 12 has um, some gifts as well. And then Ephesians 4, this is important. Ephesians 4 has highlights five gifts, okay? And that's apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, and evangelists. Now, these gifts, and just trying to help you a little bit here theologically, these gifts that we're reading here, the gifts of the Spirit, they're referred to as manifestations, okay? But I believe that the gifts that are highlighted in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, they actually come as people, I believe that they're people, okay? That God has called some people with an apostolic gifting, not capital A, I saw the Lord apostle, but as in there's people that can help start churches and multiple churches. I actually think Pastor A, capital, small A, falls into that sort of apostolic ability. God has given that ability to start churches. And there's other people. Remember Luis Palau? Everyone, we're all called to evangelism, but he was an evangelist, yes? I mean, he could have read the newspaper and we all would have got saved. I mean, it was just like, wow, this guy's incredible. He was an evangelist. So do you see the difference there? We all do it, but there's some people are specially called to it, okay? So that's just to try and help you on this one. So let's look at this here. Uh, it says here, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Now, I want you to pause there. To each one. Who's each one? It's everyone. Who's everyone? Us. To each one. I want you to get this for a moment. You can't like go, well, you know what? I don't really feel that I'm like, no. To each one. If you are a believer and if you have the Spirit of God inside of you, you have a gift inside of your life that you should be using for the glory of God. Now to each one, okay, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given and it's almost at this point like the Holy Spirit has gone full Oprah. You get a gift and you get a gift and you get a gift and everyone gets a gift. Why do we get a gift? So it's for the common good. It's important that we grasp this. The gifts of the Spirit are not that you would feel like extra spiritual. I got a gift and it's like a little ring and I'm going to wear it on my finger sometimes and keep it in a box. The gifts of the Spirit are not toys that we play with. 
They're not ornaments that we polish. They're tools that we make kingdom impact with. They're tools that we serve with. The gifts of the Spirit are not to draw attention to us. The gift, if I have any gifts of the Spirit, are to help you. I am here equipped by the Holy Spirit to serve you. And I want to say this plain and clear, okay? Anyone that's watching at home, it's great to see you today. And if you're watching at home because you have a medical need, okay? And it's just imperative that you stay at home and that's the wise thing to do. Stay at home. We love you. We appreciate you. But if you're right now sitting watching me, I can't see you, but maybe it feels like that. And you're sitting on your sofa and you're there because you like the coffee at home so much more and your PJs. God wants you here. Is that right, everyone? God wants you here. And you can't use your spiritual gifts sitting in the house, everyone. You can only use your spiritual gift when the body of Christ comes together and we start serving one another. And this is not, you know, Pastor Andrew having a go, argue with Jesus, everybody. We are alive, we have a pulse, we have the Spirit of God, we have gifts. Why do we have gifts? They are there for the common good. I have a gift of the Spirit so I can serve you. Well, what are these gifts? Everyone ready for them? Okay, there are nine, there's probably more, but we're gonna look at the nine. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, a message of wisdom. Well, what does that mean? Well, different commentators and uh, theologians have different ideas on this. Paul doesn't go into all the detail of it. For me, could it help with preaching? It could. The way that I've seen it, let me describe it this way. Uh, When Isabel and I were in Belfast, our leadership team uh, that we were on, uh, it was a great team. Again, uh, a diversity of gifts, really wonderful people. And, And we would get together as all leadership teams do, and we would discuss stuff. We'd have a Agenda, what way should the church be going forward? All of those things. But like every leadership team, there will be moments that you would just go, we don't know what to do at the moment. Like we've hit an impasse, not conflict, just an impasse. We're not sure what the best thing is to do. And people would go around the room and they would share their best wisdom. Well, maybe this, maybe that. Yeah, it's a good idea, whatever. But there was one guy on the team and he was really frustrating because for me, I believe that he brought a word of wisdom often. Now, he didn't have the monopoly in wisdom, but there were certain times, and it was only occasionally, that we would go, what are we going to do? And then Richard would speak up. And it wasn't like he went, and the Lord would say. <laughs> and it wasn't like he came down like with, you know, the mountain with Moses, like, you know, with his face shining and, you know, stone tablets. It wasn't like that. He would just go, you know what? I think that maybe the best thing at this moment in time, and as soon as he would say it, we all would go, Boom, light on. Yeah, that's what we should do. High five. Why didn't you speak up earlier? And it was just like a wow moment. And here's the difference. Lots of us have knowledge. Google is full of knowledge. You can have all the knowledge on Google, but it doesn't mean that you're going to make wise life choices, everybody. Are you with me? There's a difference. Then the next one is very interesting to another, the message of knowledge by the same spirit, okay? And for me, this is more of like spiritual insight, like, I, you know, specifics. And in my life, I've observed this and this gift needs to be used with great wisdom. And this is not like, you know, a gift that you should send someone to Africa with. And if you ever, if you ever benefit from this gift, you must to treat everything wisely, what you hear and everything should line up with the word of God. But in my life, occasionally I've met some people, they don't know me, they don't know my background, but in a church setting, like trusted people, they've just come up and they started speaking to me and it's like they've been reading my meal, everybody. It's like, what on earth? And there's no drama about it. There's nothing crazy happening. It's just, Isabel and I were recently down at our OC campus and uh, we were doing one of our, our sort of like compassion projects. It was in the evening. And this couple from, had just arrived from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Wonderful couple, part of a great church. Actually used to listen to Luis Palau. I mean, really quality people. They don't know us. And she just started speaking. She said, I was praying today. And do you know what? I felt like God wants me to tell you. And we're like, uh-huh that's nice and she was like boom 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 and I was going like how did she know this how did she know this how did she know this do you know what it was just like a word of knowledge it encouraged us it built us up and it was like wow do you know what I thought God is alive are you with me everybody okay that's good that's good look at this one here some of you are going wow 
Now, now I just, I'm going to balance this, everyone. Look at this here. This is my ultimate source. I don't get up in the morning and say, would you send a stranger to talk to me? God sends me a text message every single day and it's called the Word of God. Are you with me? And anything that happens in these gifts should only complement and never contradict the Word of God. Yes? Okay, so here. Then, look at this one here. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Now, this, this one here is interesting. This is not just a saving faith that's common to all believers, all right? We all have a saving faith. We put our trust in Jesus Christ. And for me, that's still the greatest faith in the world, the one that leads to salvation. But this is a gift of faith that some people have that literally, in some circumstances, they just like get an injection of faith from heaven to believe in the face of all impossibility that God is going to come through. And it's, they, they don't have faith for anything and everything. They have God-given faith to believe for specific projects, yes? And that's what God has given this for in their lives or specific things. And then the next one, it's very interesting. To another, the gifts of healing by that one spirit. Now, this is straightforward, everyone. Our God is a healing God. He is a healing God. Um, at our uh, Bible conference, I did uh, one of the breakouts on, it was called The Bible and Healing. I'll be honest with you, it was, it was held here in the worship center and I was going, ooh, I'm not really excited about that. A hundred people rattling around in this room or whatever. It was about a thousand people turned up for it. I was amazed. For 35 minutes, we talked about the history of God in the Bible and healing in the Old Testament, healing in the New Testament, and what all of that looked like and some of the weird stuff that we shouldn't go to and how to keep it absolutely biblical. And we talked about all of this. And then at the end, I just turned around and said, hey, uh, we're not inviting keys out. We're not having a choir. Uh, we're not doing anything like that. No kumbaya, none of that stuff. Uh, but we're going to have some of the pastors at the front, some of the leaders of the church and if you would like prayer just walk forward now Everybody, about three quarters of the room walked forward the aisles were just jam packed we couldn't I'm serious it was like chaos for a moment and I thought this actually looks like the New Testament like when Jesus turned up people were reaching out for God incredible thing was we heard lots of stories of people getting healed people that were praying for them that had never prayed for anyone to get healed got healed it was just incredible, but not everyone got healed. So this is a gift that's really important, really important. Now, we're all encouraged to pray for one another. And let me tell you, if a sick person texts you, calls you, meets you, and they say, would you pray for me? Well, I don't have that gift. No, pray in the name of Jesus. Yes, but God by his grace, and it's by his grace, no one is better than anybody else, by his grace has gifted some people. Can they heal anybody at will? No, they can't. If they could, we would go to Sutter and Kaiser right now. Yes, wouldn't we? But God, part of it is, everyone, is the kingdom of God breaking into a fallen world at this moment in time. And it's a little bit of heaven on earth. And the next one, miraculous powers. This is just like, occasionally, like Jesus showed that God does some stuff in nature that is just, my goodness, that was a miracle. Now, Hold on, I can hear some of you. The cogs of your mind are gone. The rational side of you is going, well, I'm not so sure about this. Or I went to a church and they were like this and it was absolutely crazy. Or I've never seen this. Okay, like two things I want to say. As we approach scripture, we don't put the Bible through experience. We put the Bible through a thing that's called exegesis. What did it mean? It's a discipline, a theological discipline. What did Paul mean for his readers to hear back then? And what does he want us to hear now? Then we take that and we put it in the experience. We don't go from our experience. I had a really negative experience or I've never seen it or I saw it once and it was brilliant and it should be like that all the time. No, people, we don't live from experience. We live from scripture. Are you with me, everyone? This is really important that we get this. And if the Bible teaches it, do you know what? I've got to submit my experience to it and say, God, would you give me the gift of faith as well? But this is important. This is very important. When we talk about healings and miraculous, okay, powers, this is important. Some of us are here like, oh, well, you know what? That's, that was all good for then. Uh, I'm not so sure about that today or, or that's not really me. We can do that from the luxury of living in California with exceptional health care 
okay? And, and with all the resources that we need in the world and, and with finances and with jobs and with retirement funds, let me tell you, if you are living in the developing world with primitive surroundings around you and your child falls sick and there ain't no hospital near you and if you're a mom, you're gonna believe at that moment in time there is a God who is a healer and you're gonna cry out to him. Are you with me, everybody? I actually think we've got a little bit spoilt and a little bit isolated from the whole world of the miraculous because often God's not our first call, but our last call. Now that doesn't mean if you're not well, that you shouldn't call the doctor. And can we give it up for all the medical staff in this room today? Can we do that? Because they're a gift from God, okay? So this isn't like a battle, okay? You know, I'm gonna call the doctor. I'm gonna use the call of the doctor, but I'm gonna ask people to pray for me as well. Amen? Okay, to another prophecy, to another prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Again, Thomas Schreiner says this, I suggest that prophecy is communicating revelation from God in a spontaneous utterance. So this is just like Pastor Andrew and Pastor Kurt getting together on the weekend, having a structured sermon with an outline. And neither is it like an uncontrollable, ecstatic utterance. No, it is like God speaks through you. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that when you use this gift, it is there for the exhortation and the encouragement of people around you. Isn't it an amazing thing that when this gift, and this is what Paul says, I would like it that you all prophesy. Why? I would love it in this name negative, cynical world that you would all be encouragers. <laughs> does, does America need this gift today? Yes. And Paul says, when you get together in your groups, you should be like hearing from God, not sending people to Africa. And that's not what he's talking about. Just, but just saying, you know what? God is for you today. I was reading scripture this morning. I felt that I should share this verse. And then you know what? Everyone walks away and they just feel so much better because someone has said, I want to encourage you directly from the Spirit of God. And this is the important thing. It's the Spirit of God that works through you because not every day do I feel full of encouragement especially when I'm driving on the I-80, everyone. I'm not feeling it. But you know what? It's the Spirit of God that works. And look at this one here. To another distinguishing between spirits. This is a really important spiritual gift. This is not like, you know, intuition. Oh, that person's just really intuitive and, you know, emotional intelligence. No, this is a spiritual gift that's able to discern what's actually happening behind a situation. I'm going to really ask you, would you pray for the leadership of our church that we have this understanding in this day and age? Because I'm telling you, everybody, not everything that we're fighting is flesh and blood. It's often principalities and powers, and we need to have an understanding. The last thing I want to do is blame everything on the devil, and the devil's behind every bush. I'm not going to live nervous like that, but on the other hand, I'm not going to live in life and just think everything's flesh and blood. We are in a spiritual battle, and we need spiritual discernment. Are you with me? It's what we need to do, everyone. We need spiritual discernment. And I'm going to encourage you with that for your marriage, for your family, for your business. Let the Lord guide you in this area. And look at this one here, the last two. Speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. The, 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 the gift of tongues or speaking in tongues, it's been such a controversial gift in the life of the church. And Paul here, he doesn't have a problem with the gift of tongues. You know what he has a problem with? Christians coming to their small group at church, taking over the whole service, standing up and for 30 minutes speaking in tongues in a language they don't understand, no one else understands. And do you know what? At the end of it, they feel incredible and everyone else feels confused. He goes, that's not the Spirit of God. That's your ego. Do that at home become before you come to the service. Because the Bible says the one who speaks in tongues builds themselves up through their own spirit and they feel amazing, but no one else understands. This is why he said, I would rather you prophesy because when you prophesy, people understand what you're saying and everyone feels blessed. Yay! Are you with me? So he says, I'm not asking you to stop speaking in tongues. Just do it in the right way and in the right order. It's just really smart that you would do that. And look at this here, okay? I love this here. He finishes it just like he started. And all these are the work of the one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one, yes, 
just as he determines. That's what God does and that's what he wants you to do with them, okay? And it's just for the good, the common good of everybody. So let's get practical, okay? Before we go to this last point, let's get practical. What should we do now? What should we do? If you never discover your gifts, you'll never be able to develop them or deploy them. That's the way life works, everyone. So the first thing is, that's what the Bible says is eagerly desire. Twice Paul says that, eagerly desire. At the end of chapter 12, at the beginning of chapter 14, look at me. You don't have an option here. This is God the Holy Spirit to send to every single person that's hearing my voice right now. It is our job to eagerly desire and go after the best gift. How many people can remember Christmas when husband, you thought your wife would absolutely love this? I'm, my, my wife doesn't know I'm going to say this, but she did let it out, okay, that in November, she said, oh, I think I would love to buy a pair of rollerblades. <laughs> and I forgot about this. And it was like a week before Christmas. And I remembered, I thought, she remembered, she mentioned the rollerblades and everybody I, I mean, I went through the internet. I went all across the world. I mean, I was in India. I went everywhere to find a pair of rollerblades that my wife might glide in the spirit. That's what I wanted her to do. I earnestly desired to get her the gift. Are you with me? Listen to me. This here, what Paul says is, the gifts that you've heard about, the other ones in Romans chapter 12, don't sit back passively, lean in everybody, get on Amazon, get searching everybody, and guess what? Order these, call on God and say, God, I wanna move in some of these areas, okay? The next thing is take the spiritual uh, uh, gifts test that we have here as a church that really helps you practically. Yes, you have to sign in. That means that you can go back and look at it. And also we can connect with you and go, hey, where would you like to to serve. And then today at the end of the service, no one will walk that way. Everyone will walk that way because you're going to go out there and join the team because it's God's will for your life, everyone. Yes, that we would serve in church. Let me read this last one. The impact of spiritual gifts, the impact of spiritual gifts. We don't have time to read the rest of this chapter. You can do that at home and actually go through the notes. But the impact of spiritual gifts, it, well, Paul, what he does here, he... Um, he actually uses the metaphor and the analogy of um, the Christian church being like a physical body, okay? That's why we're called the body of Christ, okay? It's because of Paul's language here. And so he uses this metaphor. And so there's no room for insecurity or inferiority. But jump down to there is no room for what? For arrogance, okay? It says here, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with what? Special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But look at this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Now, this is really important, everyone. So that there should be no division in the body. Is this a good message for America? Is this a good message for the church? So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers Every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Let me try and really make this practical. Paul has talked about these spiritual gifts, not the exhaustive list, some of the gifts of the Spirit at that point. But he really goes on here to say, in all of these gifts, we've got to work together in unity. So as many of you know, from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I was born in conflict. I've mentioned it before in the church, so not going into all of that. But my childhood was really marked by bombings and shootings and explosions and silly, crazy stuff. So for me, it was really important that for my children, especially as they came into a time of peace in Northern Ireland, that they understood some of the sources of the conflict and to make sure as well that they never repeated that 
and also that they appreciated the people that brought about some of the peace. So it was Catholic and Protestant have been fighting together for years, but it was some very courageous people that said, you know what we need to do? We need to literally step across the divide. We need to step into someone else's shoes and into someone else's world and we need to bring peace. And it's a biblical thing because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. You, you got to be a peacemaker. Uh, one of those peacemakers was a man, his name was John Hume, and he was um, a resident of the city that we had planted the church in. And I got to know him a little bit, an incredible guy. And he actually, his work yielded so much peace that he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. That's Come on, everyone, that's like, you know, that's, that's right up there. That is the top of peace right there, okay? He was given the Nobel Peace Prize. And, and this is interesting. The, um, the person that would have had the most influence on John Hume and helping him bring peace to Northern Ireland was Dr. Martin Luther King. John Hume had just read so many of his sermons and his letters and listened to his speeches and he was like, oh my goodness, we need to think about this and employ some of this in Northern Ireland and to help bring some civil rights and also peace to our country. So in 2010, um, Isabel and I were invited to uh, go to Atlanta and bring the family and preach and it was going to be July. I, I don't know if you've ever been to Atlanta in July, but it is like a human barbecue, everyone. It's just, everyone is just slowly dying. That's all you're doing. You're slowly dying. See if you can make it the winter, okay? And, and it, it was hot. So we did some preaching, but we thought that while we were there, we, we should, you know, visit some of the civil rights stuff and really enjoy that. So we brought the kids, and here's a picture of Isabel and I. Look at this young couple. Is it coming up? The picture's coming? Oh, there we are. Look at this young couple, okay? This, this is us sitting um, on the, the veranda of the porch of Dr. King's home. We'd just been inside with the, ki with the kids, been pretty amazing. And then we brought the kids over to what's known as the Freedom Trail uh, within the Dr. Uh, King Institute there. And that was like absolutely amazing, giving them the education. And the parallels actually between North America and Northern Ireland was like, wow, this is, this is just amazing. And then our trip took us on because we had friends over in Birmingham, Alabama. I was excited to see them, but I was also excited to show our children Birmingham and to go to a church. See, on the 15th of September, 1963, these four young girls lost their lives at Sunday school. Sunday school, everyone. They went to church. They went to Sunday school and someone who called themselves a white supremacist who thought that God had made them better than those kids thought they could just take out their lives. I remember standing, I'd read so much about it. I remember reading Dr. King's letter, you know, a letter from a Birmingham jail and before ever coming to America and being there. And it was just a poignant moment. Then Isabel came over to me and she said, Andrew, you need to meet this lady. And here, here's a picture of this lady. And this lady had just been driving past, stopped and she said to Isabel, could I use your cell phone? Because my cell phone has run out of battery. Come on, everyone, it's 2010. We didn't all have a cord back then in our car. Remember 2010, yes? And, uh, and she said, can I use your cell phone? And it turns out that this lady was a child and was at the Sunday school that day, 15 September, 1963. This is what happened, everybody. Those four little friends, her friends, they went down the stairs first into the basement. And you know what it's like with kids on the stairs? You know, they get a little, you know. And so the Sunday school teacher put an arm out in front of her and just said, hey, wait here and let them go downstairs and then you can go down. The little girls went down, the bomb went off and her life was spared. Her life was spared. I spoke to her and we did a little interview. We don't have time to, uh, to show it here today. But I said to her, what about faith in all of this? What, what, you know, what about faith? And she goes, oh, I never let go of my faith. And my faith never let go of me. She said, actually, this has been my church ever since. This is still my church to this day. And I didn't ask her to say this. I'm just throwing it in. She said, and I still tithe to this church. I still tithe to this church. This is where I give to you. This is my church. 
I said, that's amazing. I said, what about forgiveness? What about forgiveness? She said, yeah, I've had to walk. It's my faith that gives me the ability to forgive. And so she said, yeah, I, mean, I needed to obviously come to a point of forgiveness about the explosion, but I had to live in forgiveness every day. She said, because see my mom, and she pointed to her in the car, she said, she is African American, but my dad was white. And living here back in that day, every day was horrific. Every day was horrific. Something that really packed up my life was an explosion. But the thing that really impacted my life was my birth. My very existence was something that just impacted my life. And she said, so forgiveness was a daily choice in my life. I'm like, wow. Bayside Church, what do we do with the chaos in our country at this moment in time? What do we do with all of this? This is what I'm going to say. We don't get caught in a cultural moment. Do you know why? Because we're part of a biblical movement that's way bigger than any other moment in history. And because of the sin of man and because of our warped minds, we all, because whatever your background is, sometimes when we give in to sin, we start to think that we're better or falsely think that we're less. But listen, we are part of the church of Jesus Christ. We are the kingdom of God on earth. We're meant to be showing what heaven is going to be like. Yes? And we're not colorblind. Here's the truth, everyone. We're color blessed. We're color blessed in our lives. That's why in this month, Black History Month, we don't back off. We celebrate our brothers and sisters. And what we do as the church, we turn around and we say to a world that's pulling itself apart, literally ripping itself apart, you should come to church and get a taste of what real humanity should be like. Why? Because we got everybody from every different background and they come to our church and some of them have got American passports and the really blessed have the Irish passports and, uh, and, and, we're, and we're not naive and we don't ignore. And this is what the Bible says, when one hurts, do you know what? We lean in. And when one rejoices, we rejoice with them at that moment in time. We're a community that actually cares. And we're like the early church. The early church, the rich came to the early church. And suddenly the poor, who were the majority of the early church, the poor ran to the church because they found dignity in the church. Women ran to the church because they were disempowered, but they ran to the church. They became leaders in the church of the early church. They were empowered. Dignity came to their lives. And suddenly this new community just threw the Romans because it was all about hierarchy and suddenly they're seeing heaven on earth in the early church. And I'm going to encourage us, everyone. We have a biblical model, a biblical model, and it's called the church. And I want to remind you of this. The church, what is the church? It's not a building. We are the temple separately. We come together. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living inside of us. He's given you gifts that you should be using to serve one another. And in the midst of all of our diversity, look at me, in the midst of all of our diversity, what does it do? Does it create conflict? No, it creates glory for God. That's what it does, everyone. It creates glory for God. And I want to encourage you, Bayside Church, this is our moment. This is our moment. The world's looking to us. Let's show them Jesus. Let's bring the kingdom of God.